Hi Booktube and welcome to the last in my series of Six Degrees of Book Separation. Uh, loosely based on the Booktube tag of the same name but tweaked for my own purposes because I have a, a, my new novel out in July called Three Dreams in the Key of G and each of these six um, chains of uh, book separation that I've done starts off with a book that had some input or influence on my own novel and then the subsequent five may or may not also have fed into it but the, the first book uh, you know, has some key contribution. And today uh, this chain starts with the works of Jeremy Bentham. Now Jeremy Bentham was a Victorian philosopher credited with uh, the, the notions of utilitarianism uh, in which Bentham wrote that politics should be uh, absolutely about ensuring the greatest good for the greatest number of people in a population. Um, now uh, looking around at the state of the world uh, we seem to have uh, rather deviated from that and that the wealth gap between richest and poorest in, in certain Western societies is only growing uh, and the, the wealth differential between countries in the West and in the, some of the third world is also only growing. So we seem to move very far away from this notion of the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, on his death, Jeremy Bentham willed that his skeleton should be preserved, and indeed it is. It was fashioned into what's called an auto-icon, uh, whereby they sort of did a model of his body around the skeleton and ahead, and it's actually still on display uh, in University College London. So uh, if you have a problem with uh, the concept of utilitarianism, you can go and remonstrate with Bentham himself. But none of that feeds into my novel. The, 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 the idea of Bentham that feeds into my novel is called panopticism from the Greek, sort of pan meaning all around and optimism meaning visible or sight. Because what he was saying uh, in relation to... Um, sort of prisons is that an efficient way to keep the numbers of staff down you need to monitor prisons is if prisons are built in such a way that you have a central tower that could look at any point in the prison at no moment does a prisoner know whether he is being watched or not watched therefore he will behave himself and that is the concept of panopticism um and that I equate in my novel to the watchtowers in, in Belfast during the Troubles, during the, you know, the, 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 the conflict that was going on there between the, the sort of paramilitaries of the Protestants and the Irish Republican Army. Um, but those watchtowers were powerless to prevent, you know, atrocities on both sides. So that, that would suggest that the concept of panopticism does not work. Um, so that's quite a key concept really if you think about our surveillance society today and you know are you sort of big you know so many cctv cameras you know the fact you could be spied on through some of your gadgets you know if they're hacked into um so i think panopticism is is a is a concept that's perhaps more useful than the rest of utilitarianism um so that's the first book now the second book is michel foucault discipline and punish and this is a brilliant sort of um take on the sort of the history of the prison system really and and the sort of judicial system where Foucault starts off by saying that public executions such as hangings or, or burnings or, or, or beheadings were very very key in the power structure because the visual spectacle and don't forget people turned up to watch these things like a sporting event but the visual spectacle re reaffirmed and underlined the state's power um, and that as sort of we got supposedly more civilised and, and, you know, we sort of moved away from sort of, you know, executing people for stealing to putting them in prison. Foucault's contention is that although the body is no longer under such sort of, you know, brutal um, uh, persecution as in an execution, the moral soul of the prisoner absolutely is so you know people who were executed for public crimes you know often were not allowed to be buried they had to be buried at crossroads which are supposed to be ungodly places they weren't allowed to be buried in christian cemeteries um and foucault is sort of saying well we you know the, the sort of 20th century uh, prison system is that you're punishing men's souls for the perceived moral transgression of their crimes because the iniquities of prison but the link to uh bentham is that that you know, Foucault also talks about the panoptic uh, system for sort of building prisons. Um, so there's there's a clear there's a clear link there. So from the from this, I move on to the third book, which is Umberto Eco's Foucault's Pendulum. Obviously, the link being Michel Foucault, the author here, and Foucault uh, 
who was a real person who who basically uh, revealed to us the earth's um the earth's uh, rotation through the use of his pendulum named after him his name was leon uh, foucault and uh, uh umberto echo's book uh, foucault's pendulum is a sort of three occultists you know cook up this sort of hoax of a you know an occult thing whereby they say there's a place on earth where all power is condensed, and if you can find it, you'll have access to you know this sort of huge power, a bit like sort of uh, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark and the, and the Ark of the Covenant, and all the power that supposedly concentrates and, and can unleash. Um, but in the book, these three characters, you know, increasingly sort of believe the truth of their own hoax and, and get sort of sucked into this sort of fantasy, fantasy version of it. Um, so that is uh, Umberto Eco's Foucault's Pendulum. And that leads to the fourth book, which is um, uh, Arthur, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of the Baskervilles, because, of course, um, Umberto Eco is probably best known for The Name of the Rose, in which the monk detective is known as William Baskerville. And, of course, The Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, you know, the Baskerville estate, and they're supposed to be these sort of, you know, satanic dogs, uh, sort of, you know, at large. Um, and of course, it's only so, uh, it's only um, Sherlock Holmes's use of science and reason that you know reveal this not to be the case. It's not a theological or a you know divine supernatural origin. It has a much more prosaic uh, thing behind it. And that leads to book five, which is the curious incident of the dog in the night time, which um, the main protagonist is Christopher Boone, who is on the uh, autism Asperger's uh, syn uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, he's a big uh, Arthur Conan Doyle stroke Sherlock Holmes fan. And this starts with uh, him pursuing an inquiry into the, the, the strange death of the neighbour's dog. But very soon opens up into an inquiry into a search for his mother because he believed his mother was dead. And then he sort of increasingly finds out that this is not the case. And he goes off in search of her. And with all his sort of limitations because of his condition of autism, it's a, a stupendously uplifting book that makes you just root for the Christopher Boone. So uh, the link is obviously to Conan Doyle and, and uh, The Hand of the Baskervilles for book five. And finally to book six, Jonathan Lethem, Motherless Brooklyn. And this is also someone with a, a sort of neurological condition. And in this case, the main character here has Tourette's. And what I love about this book, because, you know, on the, on, you know, by the time you read it, on one level, it is just a sort of fairly standard detective story, although the character's not a detective, but like Christopher Boone, he plays detective. But what makes this book extraordinary is the language in it. There's just sort of these explosions of words sort of put together, combinations of words that you just do not expect because of his Tourette's, because his brain sort of, you know, like a sort of a foundry or a forge, and out come these sort of scintillating sparks of language. And the book itself, you know, there are other languages in the book. There's sort of hip street slang. There's the gangsters who are, who are not American by origin, and English is their second language. So there's the mangling of language, of the English language that they have. So it seems to be saying, you know, we all have these verbal tics, these linguistic tics. And it's, you know, as I say, despite being a fairly mundane plot, it's a wonderful, wonderful read. So there you have it. There is my final six degrees of book separation. We started off with Jeremy Bentham. Uh, the Collected Works of Jeremy Bentham. And then from him we went to uh, Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish because of the thing about panopticism. Then from that we went to Umberto Eco's Foucault's Pendulum because they share the name Foucault. And then from there we went to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Hand of the Baskervilles because of course Eco's famous character William Baskerville, William of Baskerville feeds directly uh, into the name of the Hand of the Baskervilles. And that led us into the curious incident of the dog in the night time where the main character, Christopher Boone, uh, is a big uh, Sherlock Holmes fan. And, of course, there is a dead dog uh, that sort of starts his investigation. And from that, finally, we go into Motherless Brooklyn, which is, like the curious incident of the dog in the night time, a character who is beset with a neurological condition. So there you have it. There is my final um, one of these, uh, these book chains. Um... My novel will be out in July. I will be doing a sort of... Um, I won't review it because that would be odd, uh, reviewing your own novel, but I will talk about it in a future video, give you an introduction, see if, uh, you know, if it strikes your fancy. So till then, thanks very much. <laughs>